uh, Susan Patti's the Armenian Legionnaires. I wanted also to take this opportunity to wish you all a happy spring because at 558 mm -hmm. we're going to be experiencing the vernal equinox, really? which is the new Persian New Year. Always made much more sense to me than the first of January. <laughs> but here we are, happy spring, and I hope it'll be more peaceful and healthy terms for us all. Susan Patti um, is not um, a stranger to the University of Michigan. She studied cultural anthropology um, at the Department of um, Anthropology here at the university and received her PhD for which she conducted field work uh, amongst the Armenian population in Cyprus and then went on to Armenia, to Syria, and to the United States, to North America. Uh, Patty is currently directing a pilot project, very exciting, of on uh, the Armenian Diaspora Survey, funded <coughs> by the Rubekian Foundation. Um, and she's currently based in London as the director of the Armenian Institute in London. Uh, Susan Patty has uh, published and co-authored a variety of works uh, a lot of which have tried to actually break away from the academy and to reach a larger audience. Um, and I'm just going to quote a couple to give you a sense of the range of her authorship. She has co-authored a book called Who Are the Armenians? A children's book that she co-authored together with uh, Gagik Stepan Sarkisyan and Morad Kevokyan. Um, but she's also uh, authored the book Faith and History, Armenians Rebuilding Community for the Smithsonian Institute. And more recently, her co-authored book with Vazgen Davidian and Gagi Stepan, Stepan uh, Sarkisian, Treasured Objects, Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, 100 years ago. This evening, uh, you'll be hearing a little bit of, a, of the background story of how, oh, here are, who are the Armenians? Um, how her current book that is just fresh off the press, The Armenian uh, Legion Years, came about, and give us a little bit of a narrative of the book. So please join me in welcoming Susan Patsy. Thank you, Justin. I have a news flash that I just stepped down as it's director of the pilot program, oh. and now the, it's very new news. Oh. And uh, Dr. Hurach Chilingirian will be the new director for the ongoing program. So that's because I, I want to do more writing. So we'll see what happens. It wasn't on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's yes. new. New news. So thank you very much, and thank you to the Armenian Studies Program for inviting me here today. And thank you to those of you who could come through the rain and the cold. <coughs> Um, I will just say a couple of words about the, about how the book started. If I get, I think I've got this the right way around. Um, the Carol Ann and George Najarian in Boston have commissioned this book, um, and that's George's father on on the right, with his future mother in the middle, and George George's father again, Nishan, in the middle there of the Legionnaires Association afterwards when they came back and and formed this association to continued doing um, works in the diaspora. Um, the Najarians had already um, funded two exhibitions at the Armenian Museum of America with uh, memorabilia, letters, photographs that, they, that uh, Michael Najarian, his brother, had gathered, and other ones that the museum had on hand. So these were two. One is a traveling exhibition. And I want to also um, mention that the uh, skeleton of the book is from the book Haigagan Legione by Dikran Boyajian. The Najarian's initial idea had been to just translate this book, and they had wanted me to, to do that. But then they realized we have so much material that had been gathered for the exhibitions and which the brother had gathered. There are also interviews in the Zorian and, and uh, at the museum elsewhere. So there was just much more material available, and we decided to instead get permission 
from um, Vicar Press to, to use uh, big excerpts, I would say, from, from this book. Um, Gagik Stepan Sarkisyan did translations for me from parts that I had chosen. Varak Ketsamanyan, a young historian just working on his PhD now, uh, wrote chapter two. I thought, this is a history book. I need a historian to do something here. So, uh, and yes, I used the Museum of, American, of America archives and Michael Najarian's archives. And I just want to say here at the beginning, although I don't think this crowd will have any confusion over this, but when people talk about the Gamavors, they uh, sometimes think we're talking about the people who worked on the Caucasian front, people who were fedai. They were, these are all volunteers, of course. But um, here we have Varak's um, relatives, <laughs> each serving on different fronts, a legionnaire on the right, a uh, Caucasian front here on the bottom and up on top. Another way that men served in that war uh, in the US Army later on when the US joined the World War I. But here I'll just start with, um, and forgive me if I'm going over material here you already know about, but just to summarize that uh, Bobos Nubar started talks with the French in as early as 1914. This didn't get going really for a couple of years later. But, and through November 16, about how to organize an Armenian fighting unit of some sort. And their idea then was to either join the British or the French. They didn't focus on the French necessarily. And uh, also there was uh, Mikhail Varantian and Arshad Chobanian who were part of these negotiations, members of the Armenian national delegation, basically. They had initially hoped, back in 1914, to protect Cilician Armenians. Um, but the British and the French feared retaliation from the local Turkish population if there was an Armenian legion went into that region at that point. Uh, they continued to make this as an excuse even after the massacres had really uh, taken place. But what became a turning point really was, um, I should say that the uh, AND and Nubar Boros Boros Nubar wanted was an autonomous Cilicia, Giligia, a neutral Armenia with six provinces, Van, Erzurum, Bitlis, Diyarbakir, Sivas, and Mamuret um, <laughs> Aziz. I always mispronounce that one. Uh, to be protected by the French. We are, of course, living in the time of empire. And as probably we all in this room realize that the Armenians are quite OK with empire, as long as it was protecting them. They, they didn't um, really have any trouble with that concept. And so they quite naturally thought that, that they just get on the good side of one of these, or they assumed that they were on as fellow Christians, that they would protect them and take care of them. Um, the French and British, however, had other ideas and other plans for that area. And uh, as, again, as we all know, and it was, it's sort of ironic that the Armenians' idea, their hope rested on the concept of colonialism itself. Here we have photos of Musa Darzis, and, and they really were the, the cha what changed the dynamic here. They had, in 1915, been taken to Port Said. And uh, here we, on the bottom we have some of the refugees sort of milling about. Interesting picture. By the way, I have um, mostly in the captions indicated where they come from, and you'll see <laughs> a number of different places and people, and it shows how we've really tried to gather in information and um, photographs in particular from a variety of sources. And then on the top we see uh, Musa Darzis, who have then become, once we get to the next step here, part the auxiliary legion to the French Foreign Legion. The first recruits from uh, were from Musadakh, who were already, as I say, in Port Said, where the gathering of the legionnaires was to take place. The Musadakhsis had been, or the Suediatsis, as they're called by um, Boyajan, after another village, bigger village nearby, had created a problem for the British and the French. They didn't know what to do with them. Initially, they were, of course, happy to be the heroes. They had rescued them. But after a while, they have all these people to take care of and a, a lot of them. What are they going to do with them? The French had ideas, the British had ideas. One of them was to go and build um, 
whatever was needed in Gallipoli. But somehow, thank goodness, that didn't work out. They had other ideas of where to use them elsewhere, doing basically building works, which wherever they would be sending them. Of course, the Bojos Nuvar and the others were trying to form a fighting unit, and they didn't, weren't uh, that interested in the rest of it. Other local recruits found their way to Port Said um, sort of randomly. People who had survived the genocide were walking, trying to get somewhere safe, ended up here, which was one giant refugee camp. Um, eventually, this became the nucleus of what was called the Légion d'Orient, and not called the uh, Armenian Legion at that point because of, again, its fear of raising hackles amongst the local people. About 350 of the Musadartsis were <coughs> gathered into this, and they were, of course, honored for their familiari familiarity with the region where they were supposed to go. And uh, one thing that kept coming up was their desire for revenge. So they assumed that these people would be fighting very hard and wanting to win. In 1916, the Sykes-Picot Agreement set the groundwork for the way that the territory overall would be, would be divided. And this also meant that a post-war, assuming that they won. And at this point, it also made it possible for the French to incorporate a legion of Armenians. So that then became 1916, we're already two years later, and the French also by then wanted to balance the, um, the, the British troops, or many more British troops than, than French at that point. So in 1916 September, there was approval by the British for um, a training base in Cyprus. Cyprus by then had become an, a, an English colony, a British colony. And the British gave permission to use that to the French, but the British didn't want the, colon the uh, legionnaires to be theirs. They became the French. At this point, leaders of the Armenian diaspora went out and, and publicized this possibility for people. They visited like Wisconsin, Massachusetts, Providence, of course, and all up and down the East Coast, but also in France, particularly French, France and the United States, but they also came from elsewhere. And here we see some legionnaires gathering in New York, um, ready to sail. The sign in the front says, Gam, gam, mah, gam azaduchun. Uh, basically, give me freedom or give me death. Um, one question that comes up so every so often is, why these are people who had escaped the genocide, who had come to the United States, in this case, ahead of the gen genocide. They had come at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, and some as late as 1914. But when they heard what had happened to their families, they wanted to go back and, and do something. They, they didn't know what exactly, but they wanted to go back and help. So they, um, they turned out in great numbers. Uh, this map shows you a bit of how they went across uh, from the USA. Of course, from France, they would have gone directly to Marseille, uh, landed at Bordeaux, and uh, took overland to Marseille, and then made their way across the Mediterranean to Port Said. I include this painting, which I saw in a number of different places. This is a, um, from a, a, the daughter of a legionnaire in Cyprus. She has it on her wall. But I saw it, and other, other people had it too. It's been made into postcards. It's been sort of copies of photos. And other people have made other paintings of the same thing. And I think this is an interesting uh, it brings together a number of different points. The little things that look like fish or something there, those are actually the rescue boats from the sinking, sinking ship. This is the Amiral Orly. And um, <coughs> here we find their first indication, their first experience of serious danger. The boat actually does sink totally, but after all of the men safely are rescued by the, the boats. What happened was another torpedo came along and sank the boat after everybody had gotten off. Um, so it was their first experience of, dan of real serious danger. But it was also their first experience of problems with the officers. They came utterly unprepared for that. They came with great gratitude to the French and also with, uh, as many in the Middle East have a great admiration for the French, 
uh, they were not prepared for the uh, disregard with which they were shown, the disregard they were shown by their, most of their French officers. And here what happened was they went to a, they were taken by a British battleship nearby um, to a small island. And there they were put on a Greek boat and, and told they would be t taken to Port Said on that. Well, this boat, the men looked around and found it was extremely rickety, very old. It didn't look seaworthy at all. And they conferred with each other and decided they were going to have a mutiny. So they're not even yet to Port Said and they're, they're doing a mutiny. They all refused, flatly refused to go because they also heard that their officers were not going to go with them. The officers were going to wait until a better boat came along. So this was an indication for the French as well of what kind of soldiers do we have here. They're not the normal soldier, well, yes, Captain, I do whatever you say. Th they had their own way of dealing with these things, and they also a sense of self-preservation. As uh, one of the men, Haigaz Arajanyan, uh, uh, sorry, Arayigyan, uh, wrote about how they felt they were being judged and reprimanded for the, their protest, he said, quote, would that the ground had opened and we were buried there. Would it not have been preferable to been on the bottom, been on the ship when she was struck by the second torpedo and go to the bottom of the sea with her? No doubt we would have been considered heroes without firing a single shot against the enemy. Our names would have been written in golden, in golden letters. And now, according to the French sergeant, the story of our desertion would have been written in black letters but they were forgiven. Basically, the French needed them very badly, so they went to Port Said, did some training there, and then they were sent on, the Musadatsis were sent early, a good six to eight months earlier than the rest, to start building the camp. And then, the, as the others came, as the Americans and the French came, they were sent to join them there. The, um, These, the, the Americans whom we saw, on, on we saw in, the, in, the, in the sea joined them in August. The uh, Musadaksits had already gone in, in winter time of 1917. And the men passed their time in training, but really they were there for a year to 18 months, so there wasn't, they really were trained well beyond what was needed. So they also uh, sang. There's a very, um, some sweet, some moving passages in the Boyajan book, which we've we've uh, translated uh, about the, the songs that they sang, the things that they did together, and some rather um, not so sweet things where they were really um, raiding, not raiding the villages, but getting protection money from Greek and Turkish villagers for their sh little shops. Um, things that really, I'm sorry to say, happens in times of war. It's not unusual, but it's, uh, Armenians are very loath to realize that our soldiers do the same thing. Um, and, and some, some worse things as well. Here we see some musicians, some men drinking, and we see a little boy there in the tent who appears in other, other photographs. Here the men are, are, um, were allowed to have a parade on Vardhanath's day. And that flag says, God help the Armenians. In, um, in Cyprus, I'll just say before I go on to the slide, there were further problems with officers. Uh, a, la a lack of promotion for the Armenians to officer pr uh, positions, scrapes with the uh, local people. But the men bonded with each other and made lifelong friends. Uh, Boyajan, who was a reformed hunchak, um, quotes of a, a conversation with Khosrov Nar Nargizian, who was a Tashnak, uh, with whom he vowed to devote their lives to our nation. Whatever happened next, he says, the moon was our witness to our covenant, and nothing was going to break the affection initiated and developed between us, two comrades in arms. And at the time of leaving Cyprus, at a, at a moment when they really thought it just wasn't going to happen, uh, there were 4,360 men, and that's sort of the highest number for the official count. Things changed after the armistice and, and after the, the travel north and 48 officers. This is another thing, I think 48 officers and 4,000, over 4,000 men, no wonder there were some discipline problems um, that they had. There's quite a bit written in Cyprus about this as well. So after eight months for Boyajan's group and much more for the Swidiatsis, Musadatsis, 
he says, reluctantly, we had started to think that the French had apparently deceived us. Yes, us who having made every sacrifice had left our peaceful and safe surroundings in places far off, obeying the final call of our martyred people. And now we were condemned to be imprisoned on this island, away from our fatherland, even away from our enemy. But just when they thought all was lost, they re received news that actually you are going to go and fight. But not in Cilicia, not in Giligia. They were going to fight in Palestine, which was the opposite of what uh, Zohos Nubar and the others had been negotiating for. So they were going to go and fight to help. The, the British had by then decided to stop trying with Gallipi Gallipoli and Istanbul and work on the uh, Palestinian front. So they went and uh, fought under Allenby, in fact. And um, we have another, uh, Sharam Stepanyan says, uh, on their last night before the, the fight. Once they're, but I'm skipping over big chunks. They spent also a lot of time back in Port Said, where the Musadatsis did another mutiny, uh, sick and tired of just training, training, training. And they wanted to get out there and do something. And their families were just across the canal. So they would just swim across, see their families come back, and eventually stopped coming back. But eventually. They did get there to where you see here uh, the middle person is in front of his bivouac there. Uh, Stepanian says, it was evening, and here and there under the olive and fig trees and in trenches, clusters of volunteers, sorry, clusters of volunteers were having intimate conversations and conveying wishes and requests to each other in case they did not return from the front line. They were eating and drinking together and saying, let's drink this cup to tomorrow's victory. And let's sing our fatherland, Mer Hairenik, shouts another. And they all, say, they did a lot of singing apparently. This is interesting. Oops, I didn't tell you who these people are. Uh, we have a number of people who keep coming up here. Um, Lieutenant Hagop Arevian, who was a French army, who had already served in uh, the French army, who joined as a lieutenant. Above him, we have a few more lieutenants, another French Armenian uh, on the left top, uh, Portokalian, uh, um, whose father was a very prominent Hunchak. Uh, then uh, Shishmanian, who's also in the middle, who's a half Armenian from, um, he's born in something like Kentucky or Tennessee, Armenian father, obviously, and uh, Arevian on top. Uh, sorry, Arevian's on the bottom. It's the um, I'll tell you later if you want to know. And on the right, just two men. Oh, it says right there, Papazian. Okay. Uh, we also have items like this to work with. And one of the things I wanted to say, though, there's not <laughs> many students here, but there's so much material, rich material, to be worked with on a number of different fronts. I had wanted to s make some suggestions, but again, there's... Um, I have a feeling you guys who are here already have some ideas on your work. But there's this whole diary. And here I've opened it to the page where he has a, um, a map of the battle, where they were, what, where they went, who was where. And this, is, this is the artist, diarist. This was the, high, the say highlight, low light. The, what Armenians talk about when they talk about the Armenian legionnaires is this battle, the battle of what Armenians call Arara, or in the bigger picture, the battle of Megiddo. And the, as I said, the, the officer in charge was General Allenby, who wrote a note to the Armenians uh, uh, praising them. On the left, we have uh, Ziljan, who from the cymbal family, family who makes percussion instruments, who died, and on the right, we have Sergeant Arditi and Dr. Grunberg. Sergeant Arditi died in the, um, in the battle. There were 24 men who died. Uh, and he, uh, as Boyajan calls him, was a noble Jew, in, in uh, Boyajan's words, who died for a cause that wasn't his own. Two more of the men who died. And then the burial place in, uh, on the hill of Arara. In 19, I think 24 it was, or 26, I can't quite remember now, I have it somewhere, um, that these men were, were um, there's a word for this, ex 
Exhumed. Exhumed, thank you. And their bones were taken to Jerusalem, where there is a monument to them. It was decided that there was no way people were going to go visit this sort of God, God-forsaken area and, and do homage to the men, so they, they changed, changed that. After the Battle of Arara, there was supposed to be a boat to take them to Beirut, where they would have a bit of rest and recuperation, but the boat never came. So somehow the men who were worst off, who had lost limbs or who you know, needed immediate <coughs> attention, were taken to, to Beirut, but the rest of them had to walk from, uh, from Arara to, to Beirut. And here we have pictures of them walking along the Med- Mediterranean talking to villagers along the way. But uh, we don't have a picture of another thing that happened there was that um, the devastation that was going across the world reached them there, the Spanish flu. They were struck, struck by, the, by the Spanish flu en route between uh, Palestine and Beirut and lost men there as well. So there, you know, although 24 died in the battle, many, many more died there, then along the way, we'll, we'll hear about it later, Marash and so on. Uh, so really, they, they were many losses that aren't really talked about. By now, the, the men are moving towards Beirut, um, and we soon afterwards have the Mudros Agreement, ending the war with Turkey in October, and then quickly followed by the armistice. And now we have the French and the, and the English, the British, I should call them, um, bringing their ulterior, ulterior goals to the foreground and dividing up, Syria, having more serious talk about who gets what and what's, what's going to happen next. And at this point also, the Armenian Legion changes its name to Armenian Legion from the Légion d'Orient and becomes part of an occupying force. So they are no longer fighting alongside the French and the British for winning the war, but they're actually now occupying local territory, which changes the whole the whole game. I want to just note that Armenians were working alongside other uh, groups, other other ethnic groups, other national groups besides the French and the, and the British who had brought their colonial people to fight in the war. So here we see some Sikh soldiers with them, but they were also fighting alongside Algerians, Senegalese, and, and others, um, which there's a part of the book, which I won't have time to go into here, a very sad part where they get into a huge fight with the Algerian soldiers. And and people die on both sides of that. I'm going to jump now to the um, entry into Giligia, into Cilicia. This is actually the entry into Adana. And you can see the the excitement here in in the streets. There's um, Parts of the book, and in fact, uh, just like on this presentation in, in uh, Boyajan's book, the Arara battle comes in right in the middle of the book, because really the story uh, go- goes on and on. There's much more, much more to tell. And here we have the, the, uh, cavalry coming in, and many um, Ar- Armenians on foot, and they um, were said that they were greeted by survivors. Survivors had already begun returning and were there, some who had stayed there, some who had come back, and um, some who, you know, greeted them with saying, you know, you're too late, but thank you for coming, we're glad you're here. Um, you know, you can, so they thought they would help them to, to rebuild at least. Um, next picture is, again, we, you'll, we'll see a lot of these pictures are from the John Amar Shishmanian papers, and I think there must be many more uh, things in this archive for somebody to go through. But uh, there's some very beautiful pictures there. Um, This is early morning in Adana. We have people already now trying to rebuild their lives and going out to the vineyards in the morning. And on the balcony, you see an American flag, and that is um, Near, Near East Relief headquarters there. They were, you know, of course, they're help, helping to rebuild. At this point, the British were the major occupying force. They had more soldiers than the French. But their interest was really uh, farther south, in Mesopotamia, in Iraq, in, um, well, in Syria and Palestine. 
So uh, they gradually withdrew from the, uh, from the area and turned it over to the French. But meanwhile, we have um, the Armenians were thrilled to be in Adana, in Mersin, in all of this area. Uh, people like James Shankalian, another American Armenian, he uh, dedicated his salary, they got a small salary from the French, to creating a sort of cottage industry for women who were al alone and had no way of, ha no, no income. So he said, um, he quote, there's a quote in the Boyajan book, many women under my care had been taken from Turkish harems. Previously they were in an abominable state, but after a little care they became entirely new women. I don't have access to funds to carry out such work. I'm spending all my monthly salary on them, but it's not enough. Um, you know, this he was writing to people to try to get them to, to send, send funds. He had a sort of a sewing factory for them, making things for people. I include this for um, several reasons. Tattooed girls at the top and at the bottom. This is the way the things come from the Hoover Institution, and you, you get to choose between them, and then they send you better quality. Um, and these are the extent of the captions. Not much to work with. So you need to you know, look for other things to try to fill it out. But of course, there's been a lot talked, uh, spoken about tattooing the women. And of course, um, as an anthropologist, you realize that tattooing is not necessarily branding, as many Armenians have talked about it. But it can be a sign of what local people think of as beauty, as being part of the group, but not branding them as part of the group, but rather making them look attractive in their eyes. But of course, it, for the Armenians, it was uh, these girls who were then brought back into the, into the fold were considered to be, the, tattooing is not something that Armenians do. And this um, is probably what we're looking at here is scars from doctors trying to remove the, do the tattoos because you can see that it's raised from the forehead. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just say another word about the rescuing, because this is something that we hear a lot about, rescuing. And uh, the man on the right, Sarkis Majarian, is shown with his sister and his younger brother. Um, he appears in the Boyajan book as somebody who was rescuing Armenian women. And it was done in a variety of ways. In some cases, of course, the women wanted to be rescued. In other cases, they did not. And uh, in some cases, they were taken forcibly from, for example, there's a story with him taking a woman from a group of other women and just taking her off the train, and he and his friends married her to off immediately to another legionnaire who then went off with her. And they have no idea what happened to her afterwards. This is, it's sort of, in my mind, not, I'm not positive this is rescuing. Um, and it's very interesting what happened in this family story because afterwards he lived through the whole thing, went and settled in Beirut, and somebody came to him to make the story as short as possible, having found his younger brother in Beirut. Ah, sorry, he's in Beirut. He was in Aleppo. He brought him to Beirut, and, and the younger brother says, our sister is alive. And so they get in a car, they go up to where he knows the sister is, the younger brother goes off to find her, and she says, actually, I'm, I'm really happy here. I love the man I'm going to marry. I want to stay. And they're you know, brokenhearted, but they go back to Beirut. But they keep going back and visiting her. And eventually, she starts visiting them. And uh, so we have the first step. He's accepting that his sister <laughs> doesn't want to be rescued. Second thing that happens is she's become a Muslim. And she uh, wants to, in his house, do her prayers five times a day. And eventually he says to her, look, um, you know, I, I accept everything, but I can't have prayers, Muslim prayers, in my house. And she says, that's fine. I, I know I'm Armenian by blood, but my faith is Muslim. I must do my prayers five times a day. So I won't come and visit you anymore. You can visit me. And that goes on for a while. And eventually, again, he says, Okay, you know, I think I can live with prayers in my house. So they, they continue <laughs> visiting both places. I, I just find it very interesting that there is such a, you know definite views and then it can change. 
uh, while we're on the subject of women, this is another subject that I think could bear a lot of fruit if somebody wants to look into this. There is a lot to be done here. Um, I have to admit that I saw that first upper picture amongst many others and didn't stop to look at it. I just thought, wow, it's a lot of bullets. And I kept on going. And it wasn't until I found this one, I think, what is a Girl Scout? What is this? And I finally found a tiny caption for her in the Shishmanyan files, which said she had been a fighter along with about 40 other ones. And then my mind somehow went back to this other picture and I went back and looked at her. I mean, it is a her, very clearly. It is a her. Um, mostly they're unnamed, the pictures that I have. She is not because she was sort of adopted by Shishmanyan and sent after the war to um, San Francisco where she lived with his parents and went to college and, and lived there. The Makruhe Helvagian was a, uh, her, her descendants live in the Boston area and when they heard about the book they contacted me. Just there she was, this was the very last picture that entered the book because it was just as it was going to print and they could fit it in. They, as many of the women did, um, uh, worked with as spies or as running armaments, um, sort of under their clothing and doing all kinds of, of, of work. Here they're posing for a picture. They're not, they may or may not have dressed like that during their work, probably not. But I also want to mention the nurses because I think it's really important to consider them and their part in any war, frankly. They, they're also taking their lives in their hands and dedicating themselves to very difficult work. So here we're getting towards the end of the story. We see the re-entry, the um, Armenians returning to Marash. The British and the French in Aleppo were tired of the refugees again. It just sounds so familiar that too many refugees, problems with the local people, the Arabs weren't too pleased to have all these, uh, you know, thousands and th tens of thousands of Armenians in Aleppo who had not been there before. Uh, the British didn't want to take care of them. They wanted them to go back. And they were telling them, we will take care of you and resettle you. And people, of course, on the other hand, did want to go back. So you have this, um, re the refugees returning partially forced, partially by choice. Um, so some 100,000 refugees were sent back to their, to their home. And here we have some of the Gamavor, some of the legionnaires who um, were fighting in Marash. And the man third from left, uh, third from right, wrote quite a long story, uh, narrative of the battles, battles of Marash that they took part in, which is um, from the Boyajan book in, in there. Because at this time, what we have happening at the same time that the, that the re refugees are coming back is the uh, resurgence of Turkish nationalism at a new, a new version of it under Mustafa Kemal, uh, later Ataturk. And fighting increases from September 1919. And we have, as with any guerrilla warfare, we have the, um, the, the advantage to the local people in numbers, but also in just knowing the area and in wanting their, their own land back too. It wasn't just the Armenians' land. So the, the battles were, um, uh, increasingly going to the Turkish side. And the French were easing their way out. The, the Armenians would look around and say, where are our officers? They wouldn't be actually on the battlefront anymore. Here we have more refugees in, in Marash. And at the bottom, the results of the battles in Marash. Um, as many of you, uh, all, probably everybody here knows that um, the French suddenly re withdrew from Marash in the middle of the night and ordered their, what was left of the, of the French, uh, the Armenian volunteers to go with them. And the Armenian bitterness, of course, hardened at that point, and other villages and towns, of course, I'm focusing on Marash here, but other ones suffered similar fates. Um, at this point, really, there's not much left to do but demobilize everybody. It's still at this point we have in the upper right the um, leaders of the Armenian National Union in exile in Adana, <coughs> um, men representing the different political parties, and um, also, again, Sh uh, Shishmanyan there in the center, who was 
the commander of the Armenian forces of Cilicia. This was their own title um, uh, amongst the Armenians. And they each had taken over a village on the plain of Adana and were try, ha, trying to make plans for a future autonomous Armenia. Even now, when we have at the bottom the complete, the end, the demobilization of the Armenian forces. Boyajan, um, they, they were sent on this demobilization. They were read many speeches by the generals and by the French uh, polit politicians and so on. And, and Boyajan's comment is a very sarcastic summary of one of the, these speeches from uh, General Gouraud. He says, these are um, Boyajan's words, quote, you enlisted voluntarily, fought bravely, gave many casualties whose blood sanctified not only an anonymous unknown hill in Palestine, Arara, but also the plains and ravines, the mountains and hills, the lakes and rivers of Cilicia. And now you're leaving. Godspeed. This is the gist, he says, of General Gouros and his colleagues, quote, beautiful but hollow words. No one asks why the Armenian young man magnanimously signed a contract to fight under the French flag and participate in the victory of the Allied armies. So uh, instead of leaving you on that note, <laughs> I just want to say a couple words about what happened afterwards, after demobilization. Demobil um, some of the men had already peeled off. The Kesabsis, for example, was passing up. They didn't need to go as far as Adana. Their village was on the way. So they went and formed a self-government there in that village and protected people, the returning survivors from the surrounding village, uh, Kurds and Turks and others who had been you know, raiding their village. Here on the bottom, we also have uh, the man in the middle is a, well, three on the left, actually, standing are returning legionnaires. On the left, those of you who know Razmik Panosyan, on here is Razmik's grandfather, On Basha, sergeant. The men who survived spread ar al around the world, and as I said earlier, and the women. And here we have, I think, quite moving pictures of what, um, picnics that used to happen in Providence, uh, well, all over uh, the US, anyway, of the east coast of the US. Uh, here's Providence on the top and Whitensville on the bottom. And in, in the middle of the bottom, uh, uh, behind the flag, is General Sebu, Nersesian, General Antranik's right-hand man, or one of them. So you have then now the gathering of the different, I mentioned at the beginning, the different kinds of volunteers, the different kinds of gamavors, uh, the legionnaires, the, the fedai, the, um, the Caucasian front, all, all of these people, the American soldiers. And I'm told by their uh, descendants that th these are not necessarily legionnaire or you know, the, the real army. They would just go to the local army surplus store and buy some <laughs> army clothes so that they could be taking part like this. You have them with their, their families now here. Um, and they, as I noticed, uh, noted again at the beginning, they, they formed an as associations and they wrote their memoirs. They wrote, there's uh, several of these volumes written with their own thoughts about it. Here's uh, Dikram Boyajan himself and uh, in later life. He uh, became an extremely active person. You know, these people didn't just say, oh, whatever, I've done my bit, but they came back uh, to other, all the diaspora communities and really worked hard to build a new Armenia here and there and everywhere. And here we have Shishmanyan, who uh, is on his, this is demobilization day for him. He had been imprisoned, and <laughs> he's, that's why he's by himself with his valet. Uh, leaving a ship where he had been put in prison for the last days were um, not following the orders of the French. And I leave you with here um, for the last words with a Marash cords, some of the embroidery from Marash uh, that survived that, that devastation. Um, I just want to say a, a word here about, I, I mentioned a couple of things that can be done with this material and it taking it much farther than what I've done. And of course, there's clear research possibilities there. But there's also, it's very important to think about how these events are being echoed today. 
with the Kurdish troops fighting for the bigger pro powers, hoping for you know their own day in the sun, their own the promises will be kept for them, which it's pretty clear that they won't be at this point. But it's you know these are things that keep on happening, and um, it would be interesting to think how lessons can be learned from that. But I, I also think it's important in a much more general way. This is sort of pop psychology, but to think about how these men's hopes were clearly dashed. And yet, instead of thinking, okay, that, that clearly didn't work. This was really, you can only call it a, a, an abysmal failure, frankly. But it's, they turned around and rejigged what their dream was. If our dream is to build an Armenia, we'll do it wherever we can. And I think it's important for all of us to remember that, and that there is our ways out of what seems like a total dead end, to, to go then pick up the pieces and build something else. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'd be glad to answer any questions. <laughs> oh, so I have a question. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's a fascinating archive that you've brought together, and I was curious um, when you talked about all of these different kinds of um, ethnies, um, from the Sir to the to the Algerian, right, with, along with the Armenian. You mentioned um, a, a a battle, and I was wondering what it was about, and was there any kind of, so for these are subjects of different empires who are yeah. coming together, yeah. um, who are in some way also very conscious of having been under the rule um, of you know, one of the Ottomans. Uh, and I was wondering if there is in um, the diaries, for instance, mm -hmm. any indication, and was the, the, was the tension between the Algerians and the Armenians around politics? What, what was it about? Or about arrogance? Uh, uh, yeah, you could use that <laughs> word. Um, a, a number of things come out, and I would, this is a, something, as I mentioned, I would love to see somebody do some really serious research on this, mm -hmm. to you know, focus on that. But uh, a, a lot of, although Boyajin is quite careful with his words, unlike some of the others, um, there, it's clear that the, uh, well, I'll just give you one example. The, the, um, there was a, a very nice officer, amongst all the other folks, th um, who ordered a barrack to be built for them in Cyprus uh, that would be their recreation place. And he bought magazine, had magazines come in in Armenian and food and drink for them there. But over the door, he had put, uh, somebody, not him, had put, um, um, let's say they put native, the native, barracks or you know lounge whatever and they flatly refuse to go in there because they see themselves as different and throughout you get the picture that they see themselves as different they are, we, they think native means those people th that who are ruled over by the co colonial powers the armenians in the millet system even still didn't they knew that the turks were their rulers but they had their millet system and they had their also their own rulers and felt somewhat not free, clearly, but that they, um, they were not in the same as the Algerians or the Senegalese or the others mm -hmm. who are working directly for those, uh, you, know, you know what happens when, of course, in the British and French, they would then have plantations and people like, um, also they, ha they had volunteered. Some of the other colon colonials other had volunteered, but many of them had not. You know, they were just told they were going to do this. So they they were not. They they saw themselves as very different. Uh, they were also the the officers saw them as different because they were ready to argue back. There was another incident where they uh, didn't like the food. It was evidently must have been quite bad for them to <laughs> you know because it must have been bad most of the time. But this time it was worse, and it became a huge ruckus about this, uh, and, and also the Musadaksis not just simply not coming back, just deserting, just because they want to see their families. Over and over again, you see the Armenians don't really regard themselves as beholden to the, the French or the British. They're, they see themselves as different, superior, most definitely, to the others. And the others don't like them either. Uh, uh, they get into fights. You know, um, there's a lot of drinking. You saw the, I don't know, where do they get all this stuff? I don't know. But they, there's a lot of drinking going on. They talk about it. 
uh, their nightclubs where they go in Alexandretta's where the worst thing happens. And they're, but Famagusta in Cyprus, it's a sleepy town. They found a bar, they got drunk, they got into a huge fight, bashed other people up with two by fours. But in Alexandretta it was done with guns. So people didn't just get hurt, they got killed. Um, they, they, they get into fights over various things in bars and it turns nasty. So you, you said there's a lot of uh, extra material. Uh, are you planning a second one? Absolutely not. <laughs> That's why I'm encouraging. <laughs> Shirley, would you like to write a book? I want other people to look at it. There's lots. No, I, as my mother said, who <laughs> did some proofreading, she said, next time write a funny book. <laughs> it's just too sad. Um, but there is a lot of fascinating stuff. And, but I'm not a historian, and I think you know this really does require some good archival work. And there is a there is a lot of rich material out there. Where, Why don't you do it? Where's no, <laughs> well, where's that material? Oh, it's it's all over the place. So I I really didn't touch the stuff in France that wasn't already a, a, for me a secondary source. There is a lot in France. Um, in various places in France, including the New Baryon Library, but also the French, of course, the French Na National Archives, but other ones um, around the country. You could go to Marseille. I know that there's stuff in Marseille as well. Possibly in Bordeaux, you know, where they first landed, there might be some little stuff there. Um, there's stuff in Cyprus, but very little. It was already redacted from, the, I went to the Cypriot Archives thinking that they were there 18 months, there must be stuff. And there was, but it wasn't there. And when I asked about that, they're like, oh, maybe the British took it with them. Maybe, maybe not, <laughs> you know, then why would they do that? But, it, that so, but the British Archives has some, I did go uh, to the National the War Museum in, in London. What they had was mis, um, mis, misnamed, how do we say it? it was mislabeled. Mislabeled, thanks, yeah. It was World War II, not World War I, that kind of thing. So I suspect they have things, but they, they might also be mislabeled. You'd have to spend some time looking for it. Yeah. Is there, so I presume they spoke Armenian to each other, huh? The men? Yeah. Yeah, mostly, but um, for example, the Musladarsis have their own language, yeah, not language, but dialect, which other people don't understand that well. Some of them wouldn't have. So they had a lot of interpreters. Um, they had, and, and they had amongst them men who speak French, too. So they were helping to interpret for the, mm. there, there, a, a lot of the orders had to be told, and some of the men did not speak Armenian, of course. A, a lot of them wouldn't have spoken, they would have spoken Turkish. Um, not all Armenians in uh, 1915 spoke Armenian. This, there was a, you know, this huge um, wave afterwards of, of teaching Armenian and, and like, learning Hebrew in Israel, people did very quickly learn Armenian. But a lot of them spoke Turkish. The, a lot of them spoke dialects at that point, which wouldn't have been, if with effort could be mutually intelligible, I have to say, <laughs> but a lot of people don't want to make that effort, so they just say, oh, those. No, the reason I ask that is, is so there's all these memoirs. Yeah. And it, it, now that you done, have done this work, but could a student or someone read those memoirs and find out their sort of ideological proclivities, their emotions, their what they hoped for, Absolutely. their disappointments. Absolutely, yeah, that's what they talk about. Is there anything in that that, uh, that, I mean, have you done some of that or is that available for people to do? You'll see quite a bit of it in the book. Okay. But, um, but no, there's a lot more that's not Obviously not in the uh -huh. book, and uh, in there, in, in, as, as I said, there are recorded interviews as well, mm -hmm. which are available, uh, and not in the book. Um, but Boyajan has a lot of that. They were quite clear about that. The, a lot of these men were party members, various parties, um, mm -hmm. the three main ones, the four at that point, but the reformed. But um, others were not, of course. But um, yes. They do talk about the, the psychological aspects, the emotional part of it. Um, the one thing they don't talk much about is why did we join, because they thought that was self-evident. Oh, yes. the, the one, one man did, he went so far as to say, um, uh, 
some, I met a friend as I was about to join, and he said, look, you could be the last person left. He had survived the genocide as, a, as he was only about 12. And, and he said, look, if I'm the last one, nobody's there to care. If I'm not the last one, then what does it matter? There will be other ones. And so that's as, about as far as we go into the psychology of why they joined. It all comes down to the same thing. They were angry <coughs> and uh, upset. Um, which doesn't always make for the best soldiering. No, it sounds like they weren't very disciplined. They were not very disciplined. Yeah. The, French, the French were quite upset about it. But the French had only assigned 48 officers to 4,000 plus men. That's ridiculous. And they didn't have any kind of um, incentive for the men. The, the, the men may have done better for Armenian officers, but they did not uh, promote any of them. So it's part of this, you know, the attitudes that you said, uh, the, the French and the British both took this colonial attitude to, with them and were treating the Armenians as if they were their colonial people, mm -hmm. which they were not, and they knew very well that they, they see it, saw themselves maybe strangely, but as their colleagues. And the French and the British didn't see them as their <laughs> colleagues. They never do. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh,